So today I wanted to talk about a topic that's actually somewhat relevant to my career as a biomolecular engineer. And I actually got the idea for this video by listening to an ECRE podcast featuring Dr. Michelle Margante, who's a co-author on this paper about the publication of the Cafe Arabica genome and the application of that genome sequence for studying the variation of different varietals in the wild. And if you're interested in this video and you want to learn more, I highly recommend you check out that podcast and even read the paper. I'll link both of them down below. So to start off, let's talk about Caffea the genus. The Caffea genus hosts about 100 known species, and all of which are diploids, except for Arabica. And what a diploid is, I'll talk about uh, later on in this video. But here I'm just showing you four different varietals of Caffea that you may have encountered. In the middle, Caffea arabica, which is the species that is most commonly produced and used for specialty coffee. On the upper right is Caffea canifora, which is a more commercialized species of Caffea. And on the bottom left is Caffea eugenioides, which in the 2021 World Barista Championship was featured quite heavily. And on the bottom right is Caffea stenophylla, which you may have heard about recently as a uh, previously commercialized specialty coffee that was lost to time and then recently rediscovered in the jungles of Africa. And that is starting to make a comeback. And maybe someday this stenophylla will be in the repertoire of specialty coffee. But for now, it is mostly Arabica that we're drinking and enjoying. So... Let's start off by talking about some very high level stuff. What makes a species a species? And I was saying that there's a hundred known species of Caffea. So a species, generally speaking, and this is a contentious point, but what you may have heard in high school biology is that a species is a group of organisms that can reproduce and create fertile offspring. So an example here would be a horse. A horse can mate with another horse and create another horse. And that offspring horse can mate with another horse and create another horse. And likewise for a donkey, a donkey mating with a donkey can make another donkey. What is not considered a species is a mule. A mule is actually a hybrid of a horse and a donkey. And that mule cannot create any offspring. It is infertile. And biologically speaking, a horse has 64 chromosomes and a donkey has 62 chromosomes. And that is not a compatible number of chromosomes for your offspring to be making more offspring. So briefly, let's talk about what a genome is. A genome is just a long contiguous piece of DNA and that DNA goes for genes and genes are things that you inherit from your parents that define things like your eye color and your height and other natural things that are somewhat out of your control when you're born. They just come from your parents and these genes are organized in long pieces of DNA that uh, end to end is called the chromosome. And so a genome is the set of chromosomes that define you, you as an individual, and every individual in a species has the same number of chromosomes, essentially. So half of your genome comes from your mother, and the other half comes from your father. And that's important for sexual reproduction. So here I'm showing the sexual reproduction cycle of a human, but actually, most sexually reproducing organisms follow a very similar pathway. So in sexual reproduction, your father and mother's sex cells form what are called gametes, and gametes are sperm and eggs, and they actually contain half of their genomes respectively. So your father's sperm contains one half of the genome, one copy of every chromosome, uh, and your mother's eggs had one half as well, and when they combine, you get one full genome or two copies of every chromosome. And that fertilized egg can go on to form a new organism that can go on and reproduce. So this process called meiosis is key. Meiosis is essentially the splitting of your mother and father's copies in your sex cells to form sperm and eggs that have half of the genetic material that define you as an individual. That half goes on and when it finds another half, it, it can create a new organism. So different species of Caffea, when they hybridize in a normal way, in a normal sexual way, you don't actually create a fertile offspring. So if you were to cross Canephora and Eugenoides in a typical way, where you would take a pollen from one plant and put it onto the flower of another plant, you wouldn't get 
cafe arabica you would get something more like a mule something that's infertile and when we're talking about coffee we need fertile plants because what we're actually drinking is a coffee seed and a seed represents a fertilized egg that is capable of reproducing itself and what we know about coffee arabica is that it actually is fertile and it does that in a very special way coffee arabica is not actually a diploid let's talk about what ploidy is ploidy is just a number of chromosomes we've talked about it a lot in this video uh, haploid is an organism that has one copy of every chromosome a diploid is an organism that has two copies of every likewise you have triploids which have three copies of every chromosome and tetraploids which have four copies of every chromosome and generally you'll have a polyploid which is any organism that has three or more copies of every chromosome just for example a seedless watermelon is actually a triploid and it's seedless because when its sex cells undergo meiosis it's very difficult to split the genetic material exactly in half and to meet another seedless watermelon egg that has split its genome exactly in half and for those two halves to meet up in a way where it is capable of forming a watermelon seed. That is why a uh, seedless watermelon has no seeds. It's essentially sterile but it's useful for us uh, because we like to eat the fruit of a watermelon. Unfortunately, we don't eat the fruit of coffee where we actually consume the seed. So it's very important in coffee that <laughs> seeds are produced. Coffea arabica is actually what's called an allo tetraploid. And an allo tetraploid, an organism that has four copies of each chromosome coming from two different species. And this is different from an auto tetraploid, which has four copies of every chromosome coming from the same species. So instead of having one copy of a chromosome from Canephora and one copy from Eugenoides, it actually has both copies of Canephora and both coffee copies of Eugenoides to form an organism that has four copies of every chromosome, whereas each of its parents only had two copies of each chromosome. And that helps Arabica because now, even though the chromosomes of Canephora and Eugenoides are so different that they can't pair up and split apart evenly during meiosis, uh, now because it's created uh, multiple copies of each chromosome, there's no problem pairing up during meiosis. Eugenoides and Canephora speciated a long time ago and they've diverged so much as species that they're no longer compatible. They're their own species and they can't reproduce with one another and that's why you know they're even defined as species. So relatively speaking this very unusual allotetraploid hybridization event occurred very recently in time. So if we look at the timeline on the top I'm showing 10 million years of, of time and humans and chimps actually split apart about seven million years ago, whereas Coffea eugenoides and Coffea canephora split apart about 4.2 million years ago. And what's an interesting fact here is actually human and chimps at a genomic level are more similar to one another than eugenoides and canephora are because humans and chimps just take longer to make babies. So even though we split apart a much longer time ago, we're actually still genetically more similar than eugenoides is to canephora. So another split that we talked about earlier would be donkey and horse that split apart about 2 million years ago. And these species can still mate to create hybrids that are infertile. And if we zoom in today, the Cafe Arabica speciation event happened actually about 10,000 years ago. Whereas the first human cave painting was probably done around 50,000 years ago. And likewise, the Ice Age ended about 11,500 years ago. So really, the formation of Cafe Arabica as a species is quite new. It's actually about the same amount of time as the, the bread wheat speciation event, which happened about 10,000 years ago. And you know, the first evidence of humans making wine happened about 5,000 years ago. And this very recent speciation event in Arabica has really limited the genetic diversity of Cafe Arabica as a species. But <laughs> really, all the genetic diversity that's present in Cafe Arabica was either introduced during the hybridization event between one Canephora plant and one Eugenoides plant, or has occurred via random mutations in the last 10,000 years, and really that's not a lot of time for mutations to accumulate. I just thought it was really interesting that Cafe Arabica, in order to skirt the sterility problem coming from uh, the difficulty of meiosis and the crossing of two distant species, was able to make multiple copies of its chromosomes, and now it's the only species in the Cafea genus that has four copies of every chromosome.
But because this is a relatively recent event, it has had major effects on the um, diversity of Caria arabica as a species. So in future episodes, I want to talk about some other really interesting aspects about the genetics of Caffea arabica. Like for example, because it's so limited in genetic diversity, it makes it very easy to trace coffee migration throughout history using just genetic fingerprints. There's also um, some of the curious genetics of hybrid varietals like Katimor and the origin of Katimor from a, what's called the Timor hybrid, which, which was actually a triploid between an arabica and a robusta. And that was back crossed again with arabica to form Katimor and Sarchimor, which have these nice uh, properties of, of having resistance to uh, leaf rust, uh, a pathogen which kills coffee. And also, you know, for the future of coffee Arabica as a species, what are some mechanisms for increasing the genetic diversity in Arabica? And, you know, those are all really big topics that I'd love to talk about in future episodes. So thanks for sticking with me through this video, and I hope you found it as interesting as I did. And again, if you, if you want to learn more, check out this paper or check out this podcast, or you can wait for my next episode. Thanks. Goodbye.